Sunda di kita tak pada tak sepana. So today the debate, uh, the students debated on Tibetan language letters, uh, and also they debated on uh, signs. Uh, this is the first time, so this has not happened in Tibet itself. So we have been able to start this uh, in exile. I would like to congratulate you and praise you for this. The day before yesterday, we t didn't we talk about uh, including using the Tibetan um, logic uh, and reasoning that we have in the Tibetan tradition on other subjects like sub uh, science and other subjects. So, so we have talked about it the day before yesterday. And I have said uh, to people that this is possible. Um, uh, yes. And we have, as Tibetans have started this this time. It's very good. So as Tibetans, we uh, we have been uh, we have made a plan uh, for negative. So it's, since five years we have uh, started a project of translating science into Tibetan uh, so that we Tibetans uh, could study science into uh, in Tibetan language. So right now, uh, just a while ago, some students debated actually uh, in the, uh, uh, mixing Tibetan and English, uh, when they were actually giving the definition and uh, so forth, the, the uh, relationship between different things. They were talking in English, but then uh, the procedure of the debate was basically uh, uh, in Tibetan. When they talked uh, about uh, whether uh, the X is necessarily Y or so forth. So Tibetan language is very precise in using this kind of uh, logical debate. So the way we uh, analyze and investigate things through uh, logic and reasoning is very precise. The, la the language itself, Tibetan language, is very precise for that. So of course, logic uh, was uh, had come from that is the uh, Nalanda University scholars uh, originated from them, and using that as the basis, then we uh, Tibetans started the procedure of the debating. Uh, eventually, uh, it must have grown and evolved in Tibet. So now we are uh, rather, we have become adept with this uh, kind of debating procedure. So I have uh, noticed that some Chinese are now um, beginning to put some effort in using this kind of debating procedure in their own language. Uh, so here, the students have taken interest, and then the teachers and also the concerned people so have kept this in mind and kept this in mind, and we could uh, have a new kind of a, a way of educating people by using logic and debate and kind of um, innovation. So I'll do the Manjushri blessing late, uh, later. But for now, I'm going to go through the uh, text. We are on uh, verse number nine, on page sixty-eight. <laughs> Thank you. 
to help heal sentient beings, O Benefactor, you have taught the peerless reason to a certain emptiness, the heart of the teaching, this way of dependent origination, those who perceive it as in contradictory or unestablished, or can they comprehend your system? So what these two uh, verses say that, say yes, the Buddha was totally dedicated for the well-being of other sentient beings, and how he helped the sentient beings uh, is by uh, overcoming their uh, defilements in their minds, the uh, negative emotions, and uh, their residual or imprints. Now, in order to reach the Buddhahood, uh, omniscient state, one has to understand uh, emptiness, gain insight into emptiness, and this uh, emptiness is uh, also termed as the uh, uh, middle path the uh, at the basis level. So because things are dependently arisen, therefore there is nothing which is independently existing. So when you talk about things being merely conventionally designated, uh, dependently designated, therefore it shows that things are uh, not independently existent. Because things are designated by way of dependence, uh, this helps to overcome the uh, view of uh, the extreme of nihilism. And on the other hand, uh, so the middle way is the, uh, that which is uh, free from the two extremes of nihilism and eternalism or permanence. So we have, uh, uh, have been uh, habituating, we have uh, been accustomed with uh, the th uh, things having some kind of solid, uh, concrete existence, uh, independent existence. And because of that, when someone says things are merely nominal, merely conventional, uh, we are not able to actually uh, take that. And therefore, when the Buddha says, uh, uses the reasoning of dependent origination to prove that things have no intrinsic existence, as it says here, emptiness, the heart of the teaching of the, the heart of the teaching, this way of dependent origination. So we uh, cling to the things having some kind of independent existence, some kind of solid, uh, concrete existence from their uh, side, objectively, because of our accustomation with uh, this kind of way of looking at things. And today, in quantum physics, when people actually uh, in, in analyze the particles, and then they don't find anything to point to as this or that thing, and therefore the scientists say that there's nothing objectively there, and they get the idea that there is really nothing um, to pinpoint it. Now, the Prasankika Madhyamaka say that things, of course, do not have any intrinsic existence, but then they exist by way of conventional designation, uh, merely by way of convention, and therefore the scientists, are, when they do investigation on particles, they are not able to uh, they're not able to find anything that is out there objectively, and therefore they um, tend, uh, see that things are merely subjective, uh, subjectively existent. So what has been said since uh, 2000, uh, more than 2000 years, uh, by the Madhyamakas is that things are merely nominal, things are merely conventional. 
but how things, when we look at things, um, when they appear to us, how do they appear to us, is they, have, they appear to us as if they have some kind of objective existence. And so even with amongst the, with these philosophical schools, there are those who, uh, do not, who are not able to comprehend this uh, deeper meaning of dependent origination as Prasankika Madhyamakas uh, have uh, understand. So, of course, things, there are causes and effects and also the identity of things. So, the lower schools of uh, the philosophical schools say that because there are these things, causes, effects, and the identity of things, therefore, they say that they are the things have uh, some essential existence. Uh, objective existence, and therefore, this uh, the text says those who perceive it as contradictory, saying that uh, or honest uh, that things because they have the causes, the effects, and the identities of things are there. Therefore, there is uh, intrinsic existence. Actually, use a reasoning that is contradictory to reality. And then other schools of Tenet, such as uh, no, uh, non-Buddhist schools, like the Jainism, for example, uh, for them, uh, being dependent on origination is something that uh, they don't, uh, they are not actually able to comprehend. Uh, they don't use the term. I don't know exactly how the uh, Jainism, Jain, Jains say this. So they seem to uh, believe in uh, causality, the uh, dependence in terms of causality, but then uh, still uh, they say that there is an Atman or a soul which actually uh, utilizes the things around them. Um, so although the things do come from causes and conditions, but then the utilizer of the things, uh, the uh, Atman, is something which is permanent. So they are not able to get the full uh, understanding of dependent origination such. So they don't use the term the dependent arising. Or so for them to say that things have no intrinsic existence because they are dependent or originated, if you use this reasoning, they would say the reason is unestablished, not validated for us. So being non-intrinsically existent, and uh, dependent origination, dependently originated, are contradictory or, or uh, contradictory for some, and for others, that uh, dependent origination is something that actually uh, they don't accept. And therefore, it says, uh, as uh, those who perceive it as contradictory or unestablished, how can they comprehend your system? The why so for you, when one sees emptiness in terms of the meaning of dependent origination, then being de devoid of intrinsic existence and possessing valid functions do not contradict. Whereas one who sees the opposite, since there is, there can be no function in emptiness, nor emptiness in what has functions, one falls into the dreadful abyss. You remain. Therefore, in your teaching, seeing dependent origination is hailed, that too, not as an utter non-existence, nor as an intrinsic existence. The non-contingent non is like the sky flower. Uh, hence, there is nothing that is not dependent. If things exist through their own essence, the dependence on cause and conditions for their existence is contradictory. So, as long as the, uh, something is dependent on others, it cannot be self-sufficient. When you have something which is not dependent, then you can say that is rather self-sufficient. We usually talk about such things in our life also. Or oh, this 
person is not uh, able to support himself or herself, or this thing is not able to support or sustain itself uh, uh, without depending on others, because they depend on others. So, uh, in effect, if an effect were to uh, exist from its own side, objectively, what, the, what can the cause do to it? How can the cause help it? So the effect, an effect has its cause, and if the effect were uh, to have an essence in itself without depending on the causes. Uh, so the, the effect uh, cannot have its own existence without depending on a cause. So an effect arises because of a cause, and so due to a cause, an effect arises. So that shows that an effect arises in dependence on another thing, and therefore it's contingent upon that thing, and therefore it cannot have, uh, it cannot be independently existing. So. Things should either be dependent on other factors or non-dependent or independent. Uh, there is no third alternative. So these two, dependent, being dependent and independent, are mutually exclusive. So, uh, in another case, we can talk about the relationship between the uh, um, human person, a human being, and a horse. Of course, because they are not mutually exclusive, we can have a, a third alternative uh, that we can point to as neither being the horse nor being the uh, human. But then, being dependent and independent, these two are mutually exclusive, and therefore you cannot have a third alternative which is neither dependent nor independent. You cannot have something which is neither of these two. So regarding a cause, if the cause were to exist um, essentially from its own side, then it should be a cause all the time. But then, a cause is a cause, independence or in relation to its effect. A cause is called that which helps to bring about something, and an effect is called that which is helped. Uh, or, uh, therefore, these two, something that helps and something that is helped, the helped and the, help, the helper, are dependent, mutually dependent on each other. And therefore, a cause gains its identity, not because it arises from an effect, but because it uh, gains its identity in relation to its effect. But when we look at things, uh, the, uh, the cause and the cause and the effects, they don't appear to us as being dependent, mutually dependent. So in Madhyamaka Kamula Madhyamaka Karika, Nagarjuna says that a doer, an actor, uh, is posited in relation to the action, and an action in relation to the actor, and then the object acted upon. Without that, you cannot talk about an actor and an action, uh, and where the action happens. Nagarjuna sees that if things were to have intrinsically existent uh, and they are not depend then uh, they would be not dependent on causes and conditions. Uh, so Nagarjuna sees. Uh, non, uh, other uh, philosophical uh, followers of other philosophical schools that because things have some identity of their own, therefore they have essential existence. They exist objectively. 
And so to this Nagarjuna responds that if they were to have any intrinsic existence, then they cannot depend on others. But you can see in the world that things depend on causes and conditions. So if things were to have intrinsic existence, they cannot be dependent on causes and conditions. Therefore, in your teaching, seeing dependent origination is hailed that too, uh, not at uh, uh, verse number 15. Therefore, since no phenomena exists other than origination through dependence, no phenomena exists other than being devoid of intrinsic existence, you taught. So, as long as something is affected through causes and conditions, and uh, the causes can act um, on it, then uh, it cannot be intrinsically existent, independently existent. So when some uh, negative emotion arises us, they uh, happen in dependence on uh, the stimulus from outside as well as our state of mind. So if our mind as such uh, were to be in the nature of the delusion or these afflictive emotions, then uh, we could always have anger all the time. But even if the, somebody is a very uh, short-tempered, a uh, very angry t uh, type of person, that person will not remain angry all the time for years and years on. So long as somebody lives, he or she is not always uh, overcome with anger or attachment all the time. But these uh, emotions arise in dependence on causes and conditions. And so, because intrinsic nature cannot be negated, if phenomena possess some intrinsic nature, nirvana would be, become impossible and elaborations could not be seized, you taught. Therefore, you, who could challenge you? You who proclaim with lion's roar in the assembly of learned ones repeatedly that everything is utterly free of intrinsic nature, that there is no intrinsic existence at all, and that all functions as this arising independent on that, what need is there to say that these two converge without conflict? So because things are dependently arisen, therefore they are not independently existent. And because they are not independently existent, what that indicates is that things are dependent. And so the reasoning of dependent origination can overcome both the extremes of nihilism and eternalism at the same time, simultaneously. Whereas other reasonings, the reasons that are used to prove emptiness, uh, such as the lack of um, many and... Uh, 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 one and many and uh, so forth, cannot do that. In, uh, it is through the reason of dependent origination that one does not lean towards an extreme that, you'll de that you have declared this excellently is the reason, O oh, Savior, of your being an unexcelled uh, speaker. All of this is devoid of essence, and from this arises that effect. These two certainties complement each other with no contradiction at all. So Jerem Buche, Namazan Kappa, says that so maybe for some it may be difficult to uh, posit the, uh, the dependence on causes and conditions, although you may have studied the uh, profound teaching of dependent origination or um, the emptiness. So once you have rejected that there is intrinsic existence, the uh, following that, 
uh, it would be difficult for some to see that although there's no intrinsic existence, but then still things are uh, exist by way of convention. That is the difficulty in Madhyamaka philosophy. So for this uh, to be able to uh, complement the understanding of uh, the in non-intrinsic existence with the uh, understanding of conventionality of things, uh, you have to uh, practice, uh, do practices to uh, accumulate merit and uh, purify negativities. So there is a difference between realizing the, uh, the emptiness or the correct view and the um, completing the analysis into the, uh, this. In Nagarjuna's garland, garland of um, a precious, precious garland, form is mere name, space is mere name. And when there is no uh, elements, the, the basic element, uh, how can they be seen? So things that come through causes and conditions and also uh, thing, everything that is also designated by uh, our language and conception, everything. So the uh, obstructive things like form and so forth are um, a mere name and nominal and also the space which is posited um, by way of uh, negating the obstructiveness is mere name and the name itself if the thing which is named by certain names, such as space and so forth, is merely in, mere, merely in name, then the name itself should be mere name. So sometimes we get the idea that when we say, well, things are merely nominal, merely labeled, then uh, the label itself seems to have some kind of a force or power over the, uh, the things, the objects that uh, it is applied to. So, but then, since the object itself is merely uh, nominal and conventional, therefore the name itself uh, must also be merely uh, nominal. And so in answer, one of Ansapat's writings, he says, it's primarily pure uh, reality of uh, this, uh, space. There is these varieties of uh, things that appear. So in the space, in the sky, all these different uh, formations of clouds happen and also the rainbows uh, appear. But when the wind blows, the, uh, these uh, dissipate into the space. They appear from in the space and they dissipate into the space. So the space of reality, which is primordially pure, all these varieties appear. But when this uh, reasoning mind uh, blows on them, then all these conceptions disappear or dis dis dissolve. Ninety three point five. So, uh, the seventh Dalai Lama also says, um, all these uh, conceptions disappear into the mind uh, just as the clouds dissipate into the space. In the Chonang tradition, there is this uh, verse. It says, I can, of course, all of you, we are human beings, and we are Tibetans. 
We are living beings. If we, somebody pricks uh, us with a needle, we would uh, feel pain. And then we can see, we, we see that uh, if you harm this person, the, that's a sin. But then if you were to uh, look at the person, where the person is, within the uh, body and the mind, what appears to us, uh, you will not be able to pinpoint at anything as being that person. But then there is the appearance of a person, the objective, uh, appear, uh, which uh, appears to have some objective existence. But when you do some analysis, then you will not be able to find it. And so the la first line, says that there is this, uh, the appearance of illusory, illusion-like. Uh, there's a bare appearance of uh, the illusion-like things. And we have all these conceptual thoughts and then non-conceptual states of mind. But then we uh, are not able to pinpoint at this or that as being uh, the mind when you uh, analyze, and therefore, the, there is the consciousness which has luminosity uh, as its quality, but then it's baseless. So this has can be ex, ex and everything this uh, disappears into or this uh, in ineffability. Even if you were to have gain a, some, uh, a little sort of, uh, understanding of such thing, then you'll be able to destroy or deconstruct any objectification of things. So this uh, youth who is uh, overcome with fatigue, uh, rest uh, in the uh, ineffability of the forest of ineffability. So this helps to uh, reduce one's clinging to uh, some kind of objective uh, existence of things. So. Uh, there are uh, differences in the usage of terminology amongst the Tibetan Buddhist traditions. So in the Gaudu uh, tradition, you have the Mahamudra tradition, and uh, Nyingma, you have the Gadhak and primordial, pure, pure, primordial purity and uh, texture, the breaking through uh, practices. Um, and then the, in the Sakya, you have the three um, uh, continuum, uh, continua, and so forth. So all these boil down to the same point. So what is more amazing than this, what is more marvelous than this, if you, one praises you in this manner, this is real praise, otherwise not. So of course, all the different, different religious traditions uh, teach love, compassion, and uh, practice of shamatha uh, and uh, vipassana are there in the non-Buddhist traditions, uh, Hinduism and so forth, and being enslaved. Uh, so it says, if one praises you in this manner, this is real praise, otherwise not. Of course, uh, we can praise the Buddha by way of, from the point of view of his uh, marvelous body, uh, but this also can be done in, in relation to other uh, founders of other religious traditions, such as Jesus Christ and so forth. And uh, they all have uh, great qualities of body, speech, and mind. But then the Buddha, there is no other uh, founder of any religious tradition who has taught uh, the dependent uh, origination uh, from his own experience without relying on others. Um, so I never say that we uh, should, uh, everyone should be, uh, be Buddhist. Uh, people should follow their own traditional religion. But we have to study, as followers of Buddhism, we have to study texts for understanding. So these needs a lot of thinking. 
Uh, of course, we have uh, stories about the Buddha's past lives and in Jataka tales and so forth. Those are stories, but then others are not just stories. So uh, we have to really give thought to them about, uh, for example, the topics of bodhicitta and dependent origination. Um, so, so I think there's, uh, it is only uh, in Buddhism that we have all these different texts for which we need to use lots of thoughts, our thought, and uh, not in others. Being enslaved by ignorance, those who fiercely oppose you, what is so astonishing about their being unable to bear the sound of no intrinsic existence. But having accepted dependent origination, this precious tre treasure of your speech, then not tolerating the roar of emptiness, this I find amazing indeed. The door that leads to no intrinsic existence, this unexcelled door to door of dependent origination through its name alone. If one grasps at intrinsic existence, no, now, now this person who lacks the unrivaled entrance, well traveled by the noble ones, by what means should one guide him to the excellent path that pleases you? So what these uh, verses are saying is that uh, Lama Tsongkhapa is not so astonished with uh, those who uh, reject the intrinsic existence of things uh, because they follow uh, their other uh, non-Buddhist traditions. But then, um, from amongst the Buddhist uh, followers of Buddhism, Buddhism the Buddha himself, uh, what amazes him is that uh, the, is those who say that things have intrinsic existence because they are dependently originated. <laughs> so whereby she can accept dependent origination, but then what is said in the second turning of the wheel of the Dharma, with the teachings on, uh, which says that there's nothing intrinsically existent. Uh, they can't accept that. So I think there may be people who say that, oh, the Mahayana um, uh, Perfection of Wisdom Sutras uh, actually uh, talk about nihilism, teach nihilistic views. So there are people, uh, followers of Buddhism, who say that, uh, who are not aware of, uh, who say that the Perfection of Wisdom Sutras or the Mahayana Sutras are not taught by the Buddha. Of course, they accept the teaching of the, on the noble, on Four Noble Truths. So the Perfection of Wisdom Sutras were taught uh, by, uh, which was taught, which were taught by the Buddha, uh, on the uh, Vulture Peak, uh, to his audience comprising Manjushri and other deities as well as humans. Uh, but then uh, there have been people before Nagarjuna's time that uh, who said that these were not the teaching of the Buddha, but they were actually um, written down by uh, Mahayana followers. So therefore, there is there had been this argument that Mahayana is not teaching of the Buddha. But then within the uh, Mahayana followers, there are the Madhyamaka uh, uh, followers of Madhyamaka tradition and the Chittamatra tradition uh, who accept the Perfection of Wisdom Sutra. But then they say that the Perfection of Wisdom Sutras are not um, definitive uh, teachings of the Buddha, but they are. Uh, they say that they are uh, subject to uh, scrutiny and subject to arguments. Uh, criticism is uh, subject to debate and so forth. So they uh, say that the third, uh, the Chittamatras say that the sutra unraveling, unraveling the thought of the Buddha is the definitive teaching. And uh, the reason why the Buddha uh, taught uh, that things have no essence, essential existence in the second turning of the wheel of the Dharma, which is uh, those of the Perfect Wisdom Sutras, is by um, thinking of the three natures. 
Intrinsic nature, uncreated, non-contingent, dependent origination, contingent and created. How can these two converge upon a single basis without contradiction? So intrinsic nature or essential existence. Uh, when we say something is just its nature, it's natural to it, then we usually think that it cannot be changed as such. This is, uh, for example, the uh, hotness is the nature of fire, so you can't change it. So what cannot be changed uh, naturally, uh, how can this uh, converge upon the same single basis uh, with that of dependent origination? Therefore, whatever origin is dependently, though primordially free of intrinsic existence, appears as if it does possess intrinsic existence. So you taught all this to be illusion-like. So I'm sitting on this throne, uh, big shoot ends in Gyatso, facing you. I am a human being, it's tr uh, true that I'm a human being. But then if you were to check where this big shoot ends in Gyatso is, just as I talked about you uh, earlier, you will not be able to pinpoint at anything as being me. So when you don't do any kind of uh, an analysis, uh, how the, the I exist, how um, what is me and all this, you can still see me uh, just uh, conventionally. But through this very fact, I understand well the statement that to what you have taught, um, those opponents who challenge you cannot find faults that accord with reason. So if the Buddha had only said that things cannot be found under analysis, just that, then perhaps there could be logical uh, arguments which can challenge his. But then he, uh, he says that things have no intrinsic existence as well. Why is this so? Because by declaring, by declaring these chances for reification and denigration towards things seen and unseen are made most remote. Through this very part of dependent origination, then rationally, for the uh, rationale for this for your speech being peerless, convictions arise in me also that you, your other words are valid too. So, as I mentioned earlier, uh, in the last days, there are great scientists and thinkers. Um, uh, some of my friends even say this. Uh, in the Western countries, for thousands of years, people have believed in a the theistic God, created God. But then, these days, people are actually beginning to question the Creator God. Uh, yesterday, I taught, uh, yesterday, I have told the students uh, this story. Uh, right now, I'm telling this story to you. Uh, Tibetan Kalun Tipa, Dr. Losawan Senge. I've met one Indian doctor. He said that, uh, who told me that the uh, God has created this world and all the creatures in it. And amongst the humans who are created by him, uh, there are so many bad people. Why did God create all these bad people? And so I know him very well. And uh, uh, half jokingly, half uh, uh, truth, uh, I told him uh, that God also created heaven and hell. And therefore, since hell has already, hell is already created, it cannot be left empty. Therefore, there must be people who should go there. And therefore, <laughs> so after creating hell and heaven, and then God would uh, look at the creatures and uh, because God is uh, infinite love and mercy, 
then he would judge those who do uh, who do um, crimes uh, uh, should go down to hell. But then the idea of eternity, eternity uh, once you uh, go to hell, is quite problematic. And also with regard to being in heaven eternally, is quite problematic. So uh, some people who are rather uh, thinking people and do some kind of a, a reflection on the teachings, they find that people are questioning about Creator God. But then they also find that the uh, practice of love and compassion uh, kindness are something that we need, but then uh, they can't actually take the saying that uh, we should love creatures because they are creations of uh, uh, the same God, uh, that this is not a sufficient reason for them. And therefore they try to taste the different traditions. And having done that, having experimented different traditions, then they find that uh, Buddhism has so many reasonings to prove. And especially Buddha himself has said that uh, his followers should not follow him uh, out of his, their devotion to him, but, but they should actually examine his teachings. And um, if they find his teaching to corroborate their reasoning and their own experience, then they should actually accept it. So this uh, people find really appealing. So people who become aware of the, te the, the concept of uh, the dependent origination or interdependent nature of things, Uh, you also will be able to find that you cannot say that uh, the, the, such a person who has taught dependent origination uh, also has taught the, uh, the attainments of liberation, nominations, and so forth. Uh, this, uh, when you uh, check into the reasoning of dependent origination, you will not be able to reject the possibility of nirvana and so forth. And therefore, also the uh, explanation of mind um, in emotions in Buddhism um, actually appeal to many people, uh, especially I have many friends, scientists, friends, who are not uh, religious as such, but then they have interest in uh, Buddhism. Einstein also had uh, interest or uh, was appealed, I mean, uh, Buddhism had appeal to him. And many uh, scholars in the West also uh, find some appeal in Buddhism. So they, are, they, they doubt about the other religious traditions, but then they find it interesting, uh, Buddhism interesting. So uh, by understanding the uh, things which can be proved through inference, uh, then uh, you will also be able to doubt about the very ex uh, extremely hidden phenomena. So following the Buddha who has given the teaching from his own experience by seeing and experiencing them himself, then one will be able to overcome one's ignorance, which is the source of all troubles and problems. So verse number 33, aha, when the wise comprehend the differences between these two, why would they not at that point reveal you from, reveal you from uh, the depths of their being? So when you understand the teaching of the Buddha by analyzing it, examining it, uh, let alone your numerous teachings, even in the meaning of a small part, those who find a settlement in a cursory way, this brings supreme bliss to them as well. Verse number 35, 36. 
amongst the seven, among teachers that teach of divine origination, among wisdom, knowledge of divine origination. You, who are most excellent like the kings of, in the world, know this perfectly well, not others. All that you have taught proceeds by way of dependent origination. That too is done for the sake of nirvana. You have no deeds that do not bring peace. So all the teachings of the Buddha comprise in uh, the, uh, uh, the Kanjur teachings. So teachings on impermanence lead you or uh, tend you towards that of uh, the uh, selflessness or suchness, reality, of emptiness. So all the uh, teachings on skillful means are uh, come under this category. And then the teachings on the emptiness or the lack of selflessness of uh, the uh, self-sufficiently autonomous uh, uh, selflessness. Uh, leads you to approach the suchness or reality and then um, the teachings are which about the uh, the uh, the reality of dependent origination uh, is the uh, teaching that actually lands you at the uh, suchness or reality so all the teachings of the Buddha can be, uh, be uh, understood in terms of these three points. That they lead you to the uh, suchness, that they approach, lead you, uh, let you approach it, and then actually landing you there. Alas, your teachings in, in such, in whosoever ears it falls, they at all attain peace. So you would not be, who would not be honored to uphold your teaching? Verse number 42 finished, 43, 44, 45. So these shows the qualities of the Buddha. Verse 46. 47, 48, 49. So before this, um, so Lama Tsongkhapa had a great uh, faith and interest in the, uh, paid great attention to the teaching of dependent origination of the Buddha. So he uh, studied all different texts, and particularly the uh, texts of uh, Madhyamaka and Chittamatra. So Chittamatra philosophy teaches about the non-duality of subject or object. And he says, uh, he said that this is really uh, confusing. When he studied all these different traditions, philosophical traditions, he found them uh, the one more uh, profound than the other. And then within the Madhyamaka's uh, system, the followers of the Madhyamaka system, there are the Paviviveka system and Shandarakshita system. And then there is also the commentary by Buddha Palita. His uh, commentary, Buddha Palita, was uh, actually criticized by Bhava Viveka. Um, uh, the Buddha Palita was a commentary on Nagarjuna's Mula Madhimaka Karika. And so Buddha Palita uh, criticized Buddha Palita. Uh, Bhava Viveka criticized Buddha Palita. And then uh, Bhav Viveka was in turn um, refuted by Chandra Kirti. So if you look at the writings of Bhav Viveka, for example, he was such a great uh, logician using hundreds of thousands of reasonings. 
and uh, but then uh, Chandrakirti wrote his uh, his own writing, uh, Madhyamaka Avatara, and its auto commentary by himself, and also a commentary, which is a, a commentary on the meaning, the content of the uh, Mula Madhyamaka Karika by Nagarjuna. And then he also wrote the uh, Prasanna Pada or elucid, uh, clear words. Uh, so if you look at these these writings, uh, they are really uh, great uh, writings. So I don't know much about these uh, philosophical um, thoughts. So compared to the Gishis, very uh, learned Gishis, I'm nothing. But then, but in my mind, sometimes many Gishis. When uh, they are able to explain things which they have studied, but then when it comes to something they have not actually seen or learned, then uh, they are. Con uh, when you ask uh, questions on them, they are not able to say much. <clears throat> but uh, it seems I am more intelligent uh, compared to them in terms of that things that I have not seen before. I can actually uh, uh, infer them. Uh, based on the knowledge that, uh, that I gained, uh, have gained from what I studied. So when you study all these things, then these writings, then uh, uh, you you actually uh, get more and more doubts. So that's what Lama Tsongkhapa is saying here. Um, at, at such times, as I studied the numerous works of both our own middle way and other schools, my mind became tormented even more constantly by a network of doubts. So Nagarjuna, in 40, verse number 49, mentions Nagarjuna's treatises. So the, his treatises comprise uh, those of the six texts on reasoning and others. And then his commentators and followers like uh, were like uh, Buddha Palita, and then uh, Buddha Palita was in fact uh, followed by Chandra Kirti. So Tsongkhapa is saying that night lily grove of Nagarjuna's treatises, Nagarjuna's, whom you prophesied, you would unravel your uh, prophesied you would unravel your excellent vehicle as it is, shunning extremes of existence and non-existence, illuminated by the garland of white light of Chandra, which means Chandra Kirti, well uttered insights. Chandra, whose stainless wisdom orb is full, who glides freely across scripture's space. So when Lama Tsongkhapa is saying that when he studied and uh, combined the text of Nagarjuna and his commentary by Buddha Palita and his uh, further commentary uh, on his uh, on Karika by Chandra Kirti, then he found them amazing. And so who dispels the darkness of extremist hearts uh, and outshines the constellations of false speakers when through my teacher's kindness I saw this, my mind found at rest at last. So when he was able to finally uh, decisively conclude about the correct view of emptiness, then he found this rest. Of all your deeds, your speech is supreme. Within that too, it is that very, that it is within the two, it is this very speech. So the wise should remember the Buddha through this teaching of dependent origination. <laughs> so of course in the Tibetan, uh, in Vinaya monastic discipline, uh, codes of monastic discipline, I mean, there are all these rules that were uh, uh, laid down by the Buddha, but this is also similarly found in uh, even in Quran, the, uh, the Islam's Quran, uh, and then the uh, teachings of uh, scripture or uh, uh, discourse, uh, which teach on the, uh, the development of sh uh, single pointed concentration. I mean, single pointed concentration is something which is also common, uh, uh, which is shared with the non Buddhist tradition. But then our main teaching of the Buddha uh, comes from the Abhidharma uh, tradition. So, uh, Abhidharma, within Abhidharma, we have the higher and lower Abhidharma. I'm talking, uh, referring mostly to the higher Abhidharma. <laughs> So if you study this, 
then uh, Tsongkhapa Kappa is saying that you will have uh, an, a unique uh, faith in the Buddha. So you, by understanding the teaching of the Buddha, uh, you will have uh, deep faith, un, uh, flinching faith uh, in the teacher himself. Following such a teacher and having become a renunciant, uh, having studied the conqueror's words not too poorly, this monk who strives in the yogic practices, such is the de depth of his reverence to the great seer. Since it is due to my t teacher's kindness, I have met with the teaching of the unexcelled teacher. I dedicate this virtue too towards the cause for all beings to be sustained by sublime spiritual um, mentors. Verse number 57. I spend day and night carefully reflecting by what means can I enhance this teaching achieved by the Supreme Savior through his strenuous efforts over countless, over countless eons. So, and verse number 58, finished. So this is, uh, this completes the teaching um, on Tsongkhapa's text. So next we are going to do uh, Manjushri, the blessing of Manjushri, which is a uh, tantric teaching. Uh, Tsongkhapa says that uh, it is renowned for people that uh, there are two vehicles uh, that leads to Buddhahood, which are the uh, Sutrayana and Tantrayana. And uh, that the Tantrayana is said to be, uh, we have unique features uh, to lead uh, the followers to Buddhahood. Uh, Nagabodhi, uh, in his writing, uh, <coughs> giving uh, one's head and body, uh, limbs and so forth, for over uh, uh, thousands of eons, uh, they, they will, such practices will not uh, lead you to Buddhahood. Why? Because uh, following the Sutrayana path and so forth, be, uh, he says, because by doing these practices, one will not still be able to overcome the, what are known as the three visions. Um, three visions are those of the uh, whitish, uh, whitish appearance, reddish uh, increase, and blackish near attainment. And uh, these uh, could also be um, labeled as the Kodrigoya Samaja Tantra, uh, the first uh, empty, second empty, and third empty. So as long as you are not able to uh, purify your mind uh, of these three visions, uh, you cannot have uh, a state whereby you are totally absorbed in emptiness while being able to perform conventional activities. So, so long as you are not able to overcome these three visions, there is no way you can uh, attain, attain uh, the omniscient state of mind. So in the praise to the intelligent one, Manjushri, uh, there is this line which says um, uh, enabling you to see the extent of all things and how they exist. So uh, all these conceptions that we have uh, have to do with the three visions. So long as we are not able to purify these three visions, then uh, you will not reach with the hood. But uh, by uh, overcoming these three visions, uh, there is no doubt that one will reach with the hood. So I'm not going to details here, but Gungyan Lam, Jamyang Shepa, 
she says that uh, both the Sutrayana and Tantrayana can help to purify uh, and he says that both Sutrayana and Tantrayana can help to per uh, overcome the cognitive obscuration. But then uh, the subtlest form of uh, defilement, uh, cognitive obscuration, cannot be overcome merely through this Sutrayana path, but you have to rely on the uh, Tantrayana path uh, to, because this. Uh, although both Tantra and Sutra teach uh, emptiness, uh, the same emptiness, but then with regard to the subjective mind, uh, the subtlest clear light mind is not taught in the uh, Sutrayana, but only in Tantrayana. So when the three visions dissolve, then uh, you uh, come to the uh, clear light nature of the mind. The clear light nature of the mind, when it is transformed into a path that sees emptiness directly, and uh, in other words, an experience of an Arya being, then you will be able to overcome the, uh, the subtlest form of uh, cognitive obscuration. So if we uh, were to say that the Buddha was just uh, someone who lived, I mean, uh, who was the historical uh, person who, had, who was said to have accumulated so much merit you know, over three countless eons and so forth, but, but then after his death, uh, some say that he is no more. So it's rather uh, quite uh, inconsistent with uh, what you uh, the, the causes that he created and the effect uh, on the lasting a very f uh, short period of time. So in the Mahayana, there is a teaching on the four Buddha bodies, uh, four Buddha bodies of the Dhammakaya, Sambhogakaya, Nirvanakaya, and uh, Wisdom Dharmakaya and Sabhavakaya. Uh, four bodies. So unless you can explain the Buddhahood in terms of these four Buddha bodies, it's very difficult to um, explain how uh, so you have to uh, resort to the highest yoga tantra when you would, if you have, would, uh, to explain uh, in great in detail precisely uh, the four buddha bodies you know, it cannot be explained on the basis of what is taught in sutrayana so with regard to tantra teachings on tantra there are uh, teachings which the buddha himself gave while he was uh, alive uh, 2000 uh, almost 2600 years ago uh, but then there are other tantra teachings which he gave after his um, historically uh, passing away from this world um, and that have come in visions of realized masters so we, we uh, cannot say that the teaching of the Buddha is great because the person himself was great. But we have to actually, that is actually using the logic um, uh, the wrong way. But we have to be able to uh, uh, come to the conclusion that the Buddha was great because of his teaching. So. Yesterday I told about the story of a Lama giving teaching and one of the audience asking a question, saying, where is the Buddha? And then the uh, Lama said, oh, up there in the uh, blue heavens, there is a the Buddha in, the, uh, in a crystal uh, mansion. But we, can, we should not think when we think about the uh, tantric deities, like, like uh, Chakrasambhara or Vajaparava or uh, Yang Thak and so forth, uh, somewhere out there, but 
Of course, these uh, teachings are according to our, the way we relate to the deities. Uh, when the teachings say that such and such deities are in such and such pure land and so forth. But basically what we have to understand is that when we talk about uh, the meditational deities, uh, <coughs> appear to us in the, uh, as uh, the enlightened activity of the Buddhas in accordance with our own predispositions and our nature, character, um, interest, or inclination. So for us to develop our wisdom, this faculty of discernment, um, higher and higher, then the Buddha appears. Buddhas appear in the form of a deity, which is Manjushri. So there are uh, various ways by which we can actually develop wisdom. So. Uh, <coughs> Uh, according to the, our own uh, objectives of developing wisdom, realizing emptiness and so forth, we have the different forms of Manjushri as well. Um, the Manjushri, orange Manjushri, white Manjushri, blue Manjushri and so forth. So these, the, the appearance of different deities, uh, but thus appearing in all these different forms, uh, uh, is to show that we have to create the causes which give, actually can bring about the results that we are looking for. Result, uh, that, that results we are looking for is a Buddhahood where we uh, uh, attain the pure body of a Buddha, the, uh, the uh, physical uh, body of a Buddha which has the uh, what are known as the main, my, major and minor marks of a great uh, being. <coughs> and uh, we have to uh, actually train ourselves in a step, uh, such as just as we uh, learn the uh, scripts, uh, letters, uh, alphabets. So first you begin with uh, by learning uh, the letters, and then you uh, started writing the alphabets. And uh, uh, in, in Tibetan, we have all these different uh, forms of writing: Tsukring and Tsukmaychuk, and then Kyuk, and all these. Uh, the so you have to train your hands to write all these. And similarly, in Tantra. Um, Highest Yoga Tantra gives, has a technique of uh, actually going directly into the uh, the clear light nature of the mind nakedly. In Doha teachings, the spiritual uh, songs uh, teachings, there are two. Uh, there are mention. There is mention of the teachings for uh, those who can uh, for sudden uh, uh, enlightenment and those who can reach enlightenment rather gradually. And so the teachings which are meant for people who can reach enlightenment rather quickly uh, uh, these teachings, if these teachings are given to people who need the gradual path, then there is a uh, fault in it because it cannot uh, serve the purpose or, but in fact be, uh, have negative effects. So the Buddha himself uh, used skillful means when he gave teachings. Sometimes he seems to have given teaching where it seems that he was uh, teaching that there is a self where he says uh, the uh, five psychophysical aggregates are the uh, burdens, uh, loads, and then the, 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 this load is carried by the person. So a teaching which is meant for a certain enlightenment uh, can uh, become a poison for those who need a gradual path. Uh, but then for those who need sudden enlightenment uh, or simultaneous uh, uh, enlightenment, if they were led through the gradual path, it may uh, waste their time. So according to the different predispositions of the different deities, we have the different, uh, the different practitioners, we have the different deities. And so to develop wisdom, we have Manjushri. 
This is a praise of the, the perfection of wisdom, the mother of all Buddhas. I prostrate the mother of all the Buddhas with his ineffable, inexpressible, and inconceivable. Um, so, uh, this is the mantra of Heart Sutra. This is a verse of salutation from Abhisamaya Alankara by Maitreya. It's uh, paying homage to the uh, wisdoms of the Shravakas, Prajika Buddhas, and the Bodhisattvas and Buddhas. This is the salutation uh, verses from Nagarjuna's Mula Madhimaka Karika. Mandala offering for the blessing of Manjushri. Mandala Kamniya Tayami. So we'll say the, uh, the text is we should say the seven limb prayer seven, three times. So we'll say this one verse together. Whatever slight positive potential I may have created by paying homage, offering, and acknowledging my faults, rejoicing the, and re requesting the Buddhas, the, the Buddhas stay and teach, I now dedicate all this for full awakening. Whatever slight positive potential I may have created by paying homage, offering, and acknowledging my faults, rejoicing, and requesting that the Buddhas stay and teach, I now dedicate all this for the full awakening. So earlier I did the self-generation of myself into the deity. So just as I have visualized, uh, the Manjushri is sitting on a uh, lotus and a uh, moon cushion, uh, holding of, uh, the double-edged sword in his right hand and uh, uh, holding uh, the perfection of wisdom scripture on his left. So uh, the uh, perfection of wisdom, uh, visualizing it, has special significance because it shows both the skillful means part of the practice of bodhisattvas as well as the as wisdom part of the practice. So how I have visualized myself as Manjushri's, first I meditate on emptiness, checking what this I, where this I is. But it is, uh, as it says in uh, by Nagarjuna, uh, uh, the Tathagata, in, in his text, uh, Nagarjuna mentions Tathagata, but I, when I recite this, I usually refer to myself. So I'm neither the aggregates nor uh, different from, separate from the aggregates, I'm not in the aggregates, and nor the anti aggregates are in me, and therefore, where am I? Uh, what am I? And so through this meditation on emptiness, I, uh, for the purpose of this uh, visualization and meditation, uh, the uh, ordinary perception and ordinary conception of myself are dissolved. And uh, from by, uh, having done that, from within the state of emptiness, then I arouse, I arose myself, or visualize ar arising myself into Manjushri, as uh, described earlier. And so at my heart, you uh, imagine a wheel, a uh, wheel with five spokes. So on the five spokes are Om, Ah, uh, Ra, Ra, Na. D in the center. So you have to visualize me in that form of Manjushri. So from the forehead from Manjushri, uh, me as Manjushri, uh, rays of light are, uh, are emitted. Um, 
and this touches the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas. In the, those of you who know this uh, prayer of Manjushri, uh, the praise to Manjushri, raise your hands. So you have to recite this prayer of Manjushri. Um, so these rays of light touch the uh, Buddhas and Bodhisattvas and their blessings come fr in the form of light and then uh, dissolve into the uh, forehead of the Lama and uh, the, the, from the Lama rays of light emit and dissolve into the forehead of the disciples thereby you receive the blessing of the body of Manjushri. You, your intelligence shines forth like the sun, free from the clouds of two obscurations, enabling you to see the extent of all things and how they exist. Thus, you hold a scriptural text at your heart, uh, to your heart. Your affection for all of us masses who wander, plagued with problems, groping in the darkness of ignorance, in the dungeon of our compulsive existence, is like that for uh, your only child. Thus, your speech is melodious with speech, 65 sets, and so forth. So imagine uh, from the forehead, rays of light emit, uh, and uh, the rays of light uh, from the Lama's forehead comes to the rays, uh, your forehead, and thereby this cleanses all the negativities created, uh, uh, collected uh, through your body, and you receive the blessing of the body of Manjushri. And the same visualization should be done uh, with regard to the, uh, the next uh, uh, level, which is the rays of light emitting from the throat of the master, uh, going out into the space and uh, uh, drawing in the blessings of Buddhas in the form of light, and which dissolves in, in at the throat of the Lama. And then the rays of light again uh, are emitted from the uh, throat of the master, and. Um, in the form of Manjushri, and uh, they uh, touch your throat, and thereby your uh, negativities of uh, speech are um, uh, cleansed, and uh, such as uh, negativities of lying and uh, gossiping, idle gossip, and so forth, are uh, cleansed. And you make uh, or say this prayer while making pray, pray, uh, your requests for the blessing of the speech. And so in it, its thunderous roar rouses us from the stupor of our disturbing emotions, frees us from the iron chains of our karma, dispels the gloom of our lack of awareness, and slashes our problems wherever they sprout. Thus you brandish a sword, pure from the core, from the beginning, and having traversed the ten bumis, your set of enlightened qualities is complete. Thus as spiritual son of the triumphant ones, uh, your body is bedecked with enlightened adornments at uh, 112. So please remove the darkness from my mind. O Manjushri, I bow down to you. So imagine that uh, blessings come from the Guru's throat in the form of light and dissolve into your throat, thereby cleansing the negativities of your speech and blessing your speech. And again, the rays of light emit, uh, are emitted from the heart of the Guru and uh, they go out uh, into the ten directions, thereby touching the Buddhas and uh, drawing forth the blessings of the uh, mind or the heart of the Buddhas that come in the form of, from their heart, in the form of light and uh, dissolves into the heart of the Guru. So when you receive the uh, blessing of Manjushri, it is said that the first blessing comes to your mind. So the sign that you are blessed, you have received the blessing of the Manjushri uh, is that your intelligence grows more and more. So I have this experience from my own experience. I have res uh, res been reciting the, this uh, prayer of Manjushri since my childhood. I didn't know, of course, I had no idea what Manjushri looked like and I have no vision of Manjushri and so forth. But then. I recite this mantra of Manjushri Om Arabadza Nade. So, when, you, when I recited this uh, D syllable many times, very quickly, um, it would seem that I was uh, in a hurry to go to the toilet. But then, when I was around 13, I uh, did some meditation on Manjushri. Uh, I did meditation, special retreat on. Uh, the external uh, Manjushri uh, for external, internal, and um, uh, secret blessings uh, by after receiving the initiation from Tata Rinpoche. So I remember that in one week, 
within one week, um, uh, my ability to memorize text really increased. I remember this very clearly. So this makes this there is great difference. And so having uh, relied on Manjushri, uh, your blessing, his blessings come to your heart, your mind, and your wisdom grows. So this is true. So the wisdom that you develop, having relied on uh, that uh, through the blessing of Manjushri, cannot be uh, some kind of a, uh, intelligence that some mavericks would have. Um, so the wisdom that you gain through uh, the blessing of the Manjushri uh, is a wisdom which can be used, which you can use to uh, benefit others. So sometimes there is danger of uh, misusing our intelligence and wisdom. Um, <laughs> So within the wisdom or intelligence, you have uh, this uh, broadness of wisdom, of broad uh, knowledge, wisdom of uh, clarity. Uh, so clarity here means that you are not confused between the subtleties of things. When you debate, for example, you have to know the subtleties of what you want to say. Um, and then there is the wisdom is, I mean, uh, uh, like where you don't need to think uh, too uh, long, but as soon as you think about something, you can actually come to some conclusion, so which is the uh, swift wisdom of swiftness, uh, swift wisdom. And then you also uh, develop the wisdom, which is the profound wisdom, which uh, by which you will be able to uh, come to conclusions through reasoning. If this, if something were this, it has to be that and so forth. And then you also develop the wisdom of uh, memorizing or memorizing things and uh, also uh, debating and arguing with others and also uh, composition, wisdom for, to compose things. So sometimes people have the first time of a kind of wisdom but not others. Uh, sometimes people have the second kind of uh, wisdom but not others. And uh, sometimes people, other people have the third kind of wisdom but not others. Um, so in other words, uh, you are requesting the Manjushri to uh, give you the blessing of uh, wisdom. So let us say this prayer, Manjushri, once again, uh, for the blessing of his mind. Your intelligence shines forth like the sun, free from the clouds of two obscurations, enabling you to see the extent of things, um, the two truths. Thus you hold a scriptural text to your heart, your affection for all. Your affection for all of us masses who wonder, plagued with problems, groping in the darkness of ignorance, is in the dungeon of our compulsive existence, is like that of your only child, to, for your only child. Thus, your speech is melodious with 60 facets. So imagine that the, uh, the rays of light from Manjushri, from the Guru's heart, uh, come to you and dissolve into your heart, and thereby cleansing all the negativities uh, created through your mind, and then you receive the blessing of uh, his heart uh, or mind. So the more blessing you receive from Manjushri, what should uh, happen to you is that you have to develop an altruistic attitude more and more. So even if you were to gain insight, direct insight into emptiness, but if you lack bodhicitta, then you will not be able to reach Buddhahood, which is the state um, free from the two extremes of samsara and nirvana, mere nirvana. And Nagarjuna, uh, in his uh, Bodhicitta Vivarana, uh, first uh, uh, goes through the teaching on emptiness and then uh, he uh, touches on uh, the Bodhicitta. So these two have to be combined. So we are going to do some ceremony for Bodhicitta here. So all of us do not want suffering, but we all want happiness. So we don't try to solve problems just on a daily basis. I mean, uh, but then we are thinking for life. Uh, 
to have happiness uh, throughout our life and not to have suffering. So as I talked about yesterday, we have a seed for compassion and love, uh, which comes fr uh, from a biological factor. But this should be increased, expanded by using our intelligence. And uh, that by using our intelligence, we should be able to see the possibility of being uh, able to overcome our the delusions, the afflictive thoughts and emotions, as well as their um, imprint. And we all have the Buddha nature within us. So there's a possibility of reaching Buddhahood. Uh, Buddhahood for the benefit of all sentient beings. We are not talking about reaching enlightenment for the benefit of all sentient beings and uh, leading all sentient beings to enlightenment uh, today or tomorrow within a short period of time. But we are actually talking about reaching that goal for ourselves and others over countless eons. So if you have such a determination to, uh, if, you, if you cultivate this determination to work for the benefit of others, uh, uh, as the Tsongkhapa has said, uh, with the help of Bodhicitta, what you actually do is you are thinking only about the well-being of other sentient beings, but as a byproduct of it, you also um, benefit. You fulfill your goal. And so if you reflect on these uh, teachings on Bodhicitta, which are taught in uh, many different texts, such, uh, by, uh, such as the texts of uh, Mahayana Sutra Alamkara and uh, Madhyamaka Hridhaya by Bhaviveka and so forth. So with the help of uh, uh, Bodhicitta, our wisdom of realizing emptiness will be able to uh, lead us to omniscient state of mind. So in order to help all sentient beings, you ha we all have this seed for compassion, uh, which is uh, at this stage maybe biased or partial, um, but in order to develop it further and further so that it becomes impartial, you should think of uh, compassion. Uh, so with compassion as the foundation, you should think of reaching Buddhahood uh, thinking of uh, benefiting all sentient beings and develop uh, bodhicitta within yourselves. So here you should think that uh, you will develop bodhicitta, uh, generate bodhicitta for the benefit of all sentient beings, just as the past masters like Nagarjuna and so forth have done. And so think, please repeat this. I go for refuge to the uh, Buddha, Dharma and Sangha until I'm enlightened. The practices of giving and so forth that I've done, may they become cause for leading, uh, for benefiting sentient beings. So repeat it for the second time, please. So you take refuge in the Buddha, Dharma, and Sangha. And having taken refuge in the Buddha, Dharma, and Sangha, then what you say is, I take refuge until I'm enlightened. So long as our uh, uh, mind, uh, this Buddha nature remains, uh, uh, defiled, it is known as Buddha nature. Um, so when this mind or this suchness or the reality of the mind, the emptiness of the mind is freed from both the obscurations of negative emotions as well as the uh, cognitive obscurations, then uh, you reach the state where you have the two purities or in the state at the state of Buddhahood. So this is what we're talking about when you say uh, until enlightenment. This this refers. Uh, this is the reference when you say enlighten. Talk about enlightenment here. So to reach with uh, this. So whatever you do in terms of practice of the six perfections uh, through your body, speech, and mind, all of them are done in order to benefit other sentient beings. So with this in mind, please uh, repeat this. I take refuge in the Buddha, Dharma, and Sangha until I'm enlightened. The practices of giving and so forth that I have done, may they become cause for Buddhahood to help sentient beings. So please repeat uh, these lines for the third time. At the end of this third repetition, 
then you feel that uh, you should feel convinced that you have uh, the uh, generated bodhicitta within yourself, just as the past masters like Nagarjuna and so forth have experienced them. And uh, in order to reach enlightenment, uh, with the help of this bodhicitta, I will also develop uh, the understanding of selflessness, the gross uh, form of selflessness as well as subtle form of selflessness. And so through these practices, may I reach Buddhahood, as Nagarjuna has said, through the uh, collections of merit and wisdom, uh, that you reach the Buddha's uh, physical dimension and Dharmakaya. I take refuge in the Buddha, Dharma, and Sangha until I'm enlightened. The practices of giving and so forth that I have done, may they become cause for me to become a Buddha, to help sentient beings. And you, Sim Chodron Buche, may the precious Bodhicitta grow where it has not yet grown, where it has grown, may it increase further and further. May the precious understanding of emptiness grow where it has not yet grown. May wherever it has grown, may it increase further and further. Today my life has borne fruit. fruit. I've become, uh, uh, I've gained this uh, human life. Uh, I've become a Buddha's uh, child. I'm, I'm born into the Buddhist uh, family. Which intelligent one will become despondent to ride the horse of bodhicitta, which leads you to, uh, from a, a higher to higher state uh, to uh, enlightenment? As long as space endures and no one spins and beings remain, may I too remain to dispel the misery of the world. So with this, we have finished this uh, teaching and the blessing of Manjushri. This is a Thanksgiving mandala offering.